Hey, party people. We are just waiting for Dr. Longo. He, uh, he, well, I reached out to him earlier this week and I wanted to have him on to talk about his latest video, uh, his Jekyll Island video. This, this presentation, three hours long, absolutely amazing. Um, Jekyll Island Uncovered. Check out Old World Florida on YouTube. Uh, it's Titanic Indians, Child Sacrifice in the Federal Reserve. Uh, I have to say, he showcases a bunch of, of heavy hitters that have touched my life. One was, uh, I think, Howard Griffith, or G.W. Griffith. I always forget his first name. This documentary, um, he's the one who wrote, um, I believe, uh, The Monster from Jekyll Island. Um, in our homeschooling curriculum for our three-year-old, we're, we're, we're teaching her about the Leviathan of, of debt, the Leviathan of, of, uh, inflation. <laughs> so Jekyll Island has been on my mind, but this presentation from Longo, oh, there he is. There's the man. What, Yo. what, 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 what? We live already? Yeah, dude. Like. I got, I got, okay. I got customers. Oh, shit. <laughs> um, I might need a minute to get uh, put, put together here, but no problem. You want me to cool. uh, mute you, or how do I? This is my first time doing all this stuff, so do I sound good? You sound great. Okay, uh, just put me backstage. I'll be back in in a minute. All right, Please. putting you. How do I do that? Kick from studio. Yeah, here I'll just I'll be back in a sec. Awesome. So as I was saying, that's Longito. I call him little little Longo. He's uh, actually the older, bigger Longo, but I call him little Longo. Us Florida boys, we we just have that type of rapport. So Jekyll Island. This was like the the push off point um, for what has become a sigil. And whenever people are doing black magic, they usually have to use energy from other beings. And his hypothesis is that they used the energy that could be considered Canaanite energy from the Tamuqua Indians that were native to Northern Florida, Georgia, the barrier islands there. And <laughs> it makes so much sense that you, if you had, you know, John D. Rockefeller's, it, his salon, <laughs> you know, his sitting room where they actually devised this plan for the Federal Reserve, um, which isn't federal and it's not a reserve, this, this private bank and trust to direct the essential natural capital of the entire United States. And so the, you have all this perfect nesting. You guys, if you've listened to the podcast, you know I'm really big into the notion of perfect nesting. This is a this is a, a law of correspondence. It's a hermetic law. And it, anybody can use it. So imagine you're you're wanting to mirror the sacrifice of people's labor. And you have these old Canaanite burial grounds from the Tamuqua Indians who were like, they were, you might as well have just called them giants. I mean, they were seven and a half, eight feet tall on average. <laughs> these folks, you know, they would sacrifice their, their firstborn and then, or not, not just their firstborn, but they definitely would, would sacrifice their firstborn. And all that energy was like concentrated into the ground. And then you have somebody like John D. Rockefeller go ahead and let's go ahead and build my, my, uh, my getaway log cabin on top of an Indian burial ground. <laughs> it, there might have been some uh, shades of Spielberg esque uh, histrionics, if you know what I mean. Um, if none, if you guys had ever seen the movie Poltergeist, it's all based on the energy of all these dead people underneath this development, specifically underneath this one house, and it, it causes havoc. But you can use this energy as a sigil. Like you can actually put it in a sigil. And I think that's what they did with the, the supply of debt 
that was being foisted upon the 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 citizenry of the United States of America. Um, G.W. Griffith, if you have a chance, go check out a bunch of his different uh, documentaries. Probably one of the most pivotal things I've ever seen in my life was his interview of uh, Senator Norman Dodd, who headed up the Reese Committee in, the, in I believe it was 1952. In the in the fifties, and the Reese Committee was there to actually look at. Oh, there he is. Add to stage. Nope. What? 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 Good evening. Good evening, man. We're both standing. We're like at our standing desk. We're like, what? Let's let's get this going. Yeah. Were you doing that before me? Were you always standing? I've always been a stander. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So when I'm doing design work, I'm usually like, I actually have to be in front of a computer for quite a long time. You probably have to do that with all your video editing, don't you? Yeah. 10 hours on the computer some days. Woo. Woo. Man, speaking Love of it. video ed editing, dude, you're Jekyll Island Uncovered. Man, I had to reach out to you and talk to you about it. That is, that is your pen ultimate work excellent whatever. pretty good what do you mean, just, what do you mean whatever <laughs> we're just getting started tough thank you though i appreciate it that's yeah that's, dude uh, high praise coming from a floridian that's right floridian sun god um you know i live on uh on supplemental road ra did you know that about me Raw. So even though I'm not in Florida, I'm actually on Raw's Supplemental Road. Nice. Yeah, dude. So tell me, what was your, like, let, let's get into this, because I think you uncovered some sigil magic that is bar none a reality. And it's something that I think is hidden from the majority, just because it's pretty brutal when you think about it. Yeah, I would have to agree. So let let's mm -hmm. set the stage. Let's let's actually tell people for those for the people out there that don't know why. Like, go into your hypothesis, or like, go into your reasoning of going to Jekyll Island and why it was important for you to go there. Right. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Toph. Appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm, uh, my YouTube's, uh, I'm in timeout right now, so I'm very happy to be given a platform anyway, you know, to be back on the airwaves feels good. Yes. Um, but Jekyll Island, you know, Jekyll Island's kind of been on everyone's radar, um, you know, ever since the creature of Jekyll Island, what creature from Jekyll Island, was written by G. Edward Griffin. Um, it really showed up on a lot of conspiracy, truther, you know, circles, whatever you want to call them. But um, Jekyll Island, for those who don't know, it's an island in Georgia where a very significant thing occurred. And I guess most people know it from that event, but you can go there today. It's a state park. And basically what happened there is the creation of the Federal Reserve, which is our current reigning banking system. Uh, you ever watch those conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory, you know, videos like kindergarten, like 2012 conspiracy YouTube was like 13 banking families control yes. everything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that was, you know, like breaking news in like 2012. Kind of. Well, that was all put into place, at least in America, and American economics was put into place in Jekyll Island in 1910. So that's why Jekyll Island is significant. There's a whole lot more to it, a whole lot in the video, lots of, you know, uh, introduction information that can be found elsewhere. But just the essentials basically is the Federal Reserve, that was on people's radar when decades later they admitted it, but they were denying that it ever happened there. The meeting and drafting conception of the Federal Reserve on that island, which was very secluded, 
Very. Um, you got some kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, basically, you've got the Federal Reserve. That kind of was unspoken. Then it got admitted. But fast forward decades and decades to 2000 or 1994, I forget. It's in the video for, for sure. But whenever G. Edward Griffin wrote that book, Creature from Jekyll Island, that kind of blew the lid off the motives for the secrecy, just how far reaching the implications of this meeting were, how great the, um, how great the, uh, you know, amassing of wealth at one time in one place. He laid it all out. But still, that was only a piece of the story. And that was in the 90s. And he, you know, would tour and speak on that. And there's some great video of that. <laughs> and then a guy named Timothy Bence basically went there on his own volition after taking a trip to Eurasia and drew some interesting connections. Tim Bentz is a Christian, what I would call a Christian mystic, basically. And you've got, he's a preacher, he's a pastor, and man of God, very, you know, strong conviction, this guy. But he went to Israel to study, research, you know, uncover, the reality behind blood sacrifice in the Old Testament. That was the reason for him going to uh, Jerusalem, I think was one of the places he went to for sure, but he went to Eurasia. And when he was in Jerusalem, he saw pretty much physical, literal proof of some of those grim stories you see in uh, Exodus and things like that. Canaanite worship, blood sacrifice going hand in hand with usury, right? How these things are interconnected. Debt, blood rituals, you know, that's, that's kind of like Illuminati 101, but these are really the origins of it, especially for America. And he went to Jerusalem, saw this stuff on his way back to America. He was compelled, in his own words, by the Holy Spirit to go to Jekyll Island. That was not really on his radar, only a little bit for the financial stuff, as he says. But nobody knew what was kind of, you know, bubbling under the surface there, spiritually, um, philosophically, metaphysically. There was something there that fostered the financial affairs. And now, now, do you mind if I interject with that? Because this is what I care, this is what I care about the most. I I, I care about the spiritual <laughs> aspect of this, because what appeals to me in the Bible, or one of the things that appeals to me in the Bible, is the talk of you have creditors and you have debtors, and you're either you're one or the other. And I love in some of your other work when you talk about how sacrifice, like when there's a sacrifice of something living that essentially puts you in the debtor, <laughs> that puts you in the in debt. Masa yep. I, I know I'm uh, oversimplifying it, but I actually I actually feel that there's a lot of truth in that. Like there, there's, there's something with that. And, and by the way, you touch on so many different things, but I love your consistency and your throughput line. Because to me, your throughput line is the living Christ. Like I, I talked to your brother about it when we did our, our whole expose on the Eastern um, Roman Empire. But this whole notion of the living Christ, like, like actually living as as close to perfection as you can, I think is something that kind of gets lost in the weeds with the evangelicals that tell you that you can just displace your responsibility on someone else. 100%. I, you know, I, I don't know um, how much, you know, 
I consciously use that like on my YouTube stuff. But I, just to touch on that, I've long been offended, personally offended, when people say garbage, like we're only human. Or, um, you know, everyone fails. Nobody's perfect. This is all like Aristotelian garbage. Mm -hmm. Like pure denial in human capability. To deny Jesus, regardless of how deep you've dug into the archaeology and, and, you know, if you deny Jesus, you're denying human can rise. That man can rise to that level of perfection. Right. And Jesus compels humans to strive for perfection, not to settle for sin and terrestrial, you know, uh, decay, perfection. Mm -hmm. And that is super lost. And that is the biggest symptom of materialism today is the whole, you only live once. Fuck it. Nobody's perfect. This is an agenda. This is philosophy. No one realizes they're regurgitating this nihilist, Darwinist, you know, un these, these under the breath mutterings that come out of people automatically. True. Is, is the slogans, our philosophical slogans of this era is nobody's perfect. Um, give me, feed me some other ones here. Just like these de declarations of mediocrity. I don't know if this is a declaration, but I'll tell you, I know misery loves company. And so our enemy has been like feeding us everything that's possible to lower our vibration to, and to lower our sights. I used to tell the, the, the guys that I would coach, I'm like, pick, pick your pen ultimate and get a poster of them and put them up. Because if you don't have the, you, if you don't have the goal in sight, you're not, you're never going to hit the target. Like you're just not. Mm -hmm. So like oh, yeah. I, I love I love the Jesus Christ story because to me, especially like when I read the Jefferson Bible, <laughs> and it's just it's just like straight up Jesus story. Like, dude, I mean, how could you not get so pumped? Like it, yeah. it like at least in my consciousness, I'm like. I can't prove anything because I'm not, I wasn't there, but I will tell you if I choose to live in that manner, my life is better. Yeah. Well, you bring up a good point. I've been saying this to people recently is if you need a body, a fingernail, a piece of hair, you know, a, a cloth that has his blood in it. If you need these things, to solidify your faith mm -hmm. in Jesus. You're not a believer. You're just a forensic crime scene, you know, respondent. To that's the, so great. To the, to the scene of a crime. Uh, right. you're, not a, you're not a believer and that's not what makes religion, religion. And uh oh, right. there's, another, there's, there's another trigger word. If you wanna hear the most low IQ spiel ongoing run-on sentence you know nothing burger out of almost everyone if you want to press the npc button that everyone has coded into them say hey what do you think about religion and oh boy mm. you'll you'll get the most you know pretentious paranoid delusions coming out of people as mm. if the word religion is some big corporation sniffing down their neck Forcing them to do all these things. You know, I don't know how many bad bad experiences people had when they were younger. I didn't have many, especially not in a religious context. I went to a great Christian school and I, you know, rebelled as much as any kid would. But I'm thankful that I had it. Mm -hmm. uh, but people need to snap out of the whole uh, religion trigger word, Christianity trigger word. You say... Uh, Everyone thinks Christianity, they immediately go to a church and say, oh, well, none of the churches do it right. Okay, well, you're not reading Jesus's words. Clearly, right. he shuns preachers, pastors, congregations, uh, indoor gatherings, yeah. donating, donations, taxes. I mean, that's, it's, all that's, 
explicitly that, condemned. That's why I love the Jefferson Bible is because the Jefferson Bible is just straight up Jesus. <laughs> there's no there's no malarkey in it. It's just like, okay, boom, this is it. Nice and clean. If I just give a little bit of attention to that and like Liz live as if in that in that space, I know my consciousness clears a bunch. Yes. So, so we are talking about like, well, I shouldn't say we are. In your presentation, you your Jek Jekyll Island uncovered presentation. I know I took you off track with that, but you okay. made like you made one of the best connections ever between the Tamukwa Indians, if hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, and the Canaanites. Or so, yeah. something like the Canaanite. Could you go in that in that direction? Sure. Since we've already gotten in the Bible, <clears throat> since we talked, you know, pre-framed a little bit. Yeah. So you said it pretty pretty on the money. You know, there aren't any Tamukian speakers living today. Mm -hmm. So you're in the clear. Um, in Florida, we have words like abacoa, but nice. then you you also have. Uh, um, like words like Juan, where a J U A, right? Now, some say Tumuqua. I tend to say Tumuqua. I like to pronounce that middle, that, uh, you know, first U, just like you would Abacoa. That's kind of where I get my pronunciation for. So Tumuqua is okay. There, there's some stick, there's some sticklers out there people who don't like to let that slide but uh the tamukua is a tribe that i talk about a lot and i love saying their name and their name has a little bit to do with the story because i was overviewing the financial uh history of the island and kind of one of the things that happened there that triggered this guy tim bentz to go down there and study and when he went to the island with the experience of the um, altars in Jerusalem that he had seen where Israelis had been doing blood sacrifice in their own words, no slander, no hate in their own words. It's in the Bible too. So it's, you know, it's not hate whether they're doing it today or not. They were doing it then. So he was studying Canaanite altars in Jerusalem. Come to find out on his way back stops in Jekyll Island and starts realizing he's on the trail of what is starting to look like a Canaanite altar in the United States in Jerusalem. Now it's kind of an oversimplification of what's going on, uh, especially, you know, the terms are a little misleading, but the Tamukua tribe were anomalous to say the least. Native Americans from Florida and the Southeast United States were more, uh, had a more refined society. Mm -hmm. They adopted clothing and guns and all these things quicker. You know, the five civilized tribes um, were centered around Southeast United States mostly. But basically, these guys were not your feather wearing, uh, you know, Geronimo Native Americans. Mm -hmm. These people had a culture and religious rights that seemed more akin to what Tim Bentz was studying in Jerusalem. These Canaanite outcroppings of the Old Testament um, Israelites in Jerusalem. Yeah. And he found out that they were committing sacrifice of the firstborn on altars. Mm. Altars are altars uh, in their own right are uncommon to Native Americans. And he points out how he's familiar with Native American culture. He has a little bit himself. I mean, this was from Oklahoma. This was, yeah, and this struck him as unusual. And he was looking at artifacts. He was he was admitted entrance to a museum. He was seeing all these things. And this is all uh, laid out in an interview with Rob Skiba that he did about ten years ago, maybe more. And he explains how he's seeing all the artifacts. And then the guy talks about size, the museum yes. di director starts talking about the height 
and they could actually see a skeleton there. And they said eight and a half feet. That's now, that sounds that sounds ridiculous, right? That sounds like a you know one of these tall tales, yellow journalism. Uh, well, believe it or not, not too far down the road in Tallahassee, they've got a bone, a femur, that I've asked multiple handymen, carpenter, um, men who work, you know, with their hands and make measurements for a living. Mm -hmm. How long do you think that femur is? Because we're not given a, we're not given a, he doesn't say how long it is, but he says, a doctor at FSU, Dr. Jeffrey Thomas, anthropology, Department of Anthropology at FSU, has a bone from a Florida uh, bog, one of the bog bodies from Windover. Mm -hmm. And it's a femur that's a good 24 inches. Wow. S someone has said it's as, it could have could be as long as 25 inches, judging mm -hmm. from, you know, he says, I'm five foot 11. He says, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little taller than that, but the guy in the video says, I'm five foot 11. And he goes, this is a femur of a very large individual. Mm -hmm. And he, he emphasized very large. Also, your video froze for a second. Oh, but, shit. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're, you're coming through clear, but. I was doing this. I was doing this earlier. Maybe snap it on and off. And judging, uh oh, what's up, y'all? We pirated the show. We're talking Florida Giants all night, baby. Let's do it. I see a lot of familiar faces in here. What's up, guys? Old World Micmac, what's good? What what? And howdy, you're all good now. Cool. So, yeah, you know, we there is firm evidence that people that large lived in that area. Number one, the first Europeans to show up there said, yeah, these guys are a full head and a half taller than our tallest guy. Then they drew them and depicted them like giants. Then the closest living survivors of those Indians are still to this day averaged about six and a half feet. The Seminole mm -hmm. Creek Muscogee Indians, tall, tall guys. And I give various examples in the video of very, very tall. They, they average as tall as the Patagonians averaged, you know, 50 years ago, six and a half feet. Mm -hmm. But then the Patagonians are remembered as being eight foot, nine foot giants hundreds of years earlier before that too. So whether there's a rate of shrinkage due to you know being mixed in with Europeans or who knows, but the Seminole Indians and some of their related tribes were averaging well into the six foot, six and a half foot range. Uh, going into the 1960s and today they're still you know average six foot or taller i've got articles i've got pictures measurements to prove all that super super tall tribe that's never talked about for some reason uh, one of the richest tribes in america the only tribe that never ever surrendered they fought to the last uh you know battle in the everglades and then government gave up made a deal mm -hmm. so the height, it's not unfounded. The things that Tim Bentz claimed right. all could be substantiated historically, artistically, um, you know, just the oral lore of Florida is that, yeah, giants used to live here. And the newspaper articles uh, support that. And then the, just the outright proof is the video of Dr. Jeffrey Thomas wielding the femur of a giant and i show that video all the time yeah on my channel on my instagram you guys can watch it give it a guess how long you think the femur is he's saying it without saying it it's a giant you know he can't probably isn't allowed to say how long it is but let's just do the math he says he's five foot eleven he holds it up to his hip 
and he knows where his hip placement is. He's, you know, deals with skeletal remains. He holds it up to his hip and the femur goes two thirds of the way down his leg. Wow. And he goes, I'm five foot 11 and this is way bigger than mine. Mm -hmm. Now, five foot 11 and this thing's huge, but let's just do the math because sometimes they accuse people of, you know, misplacing them when they're comparing to a living mm -hmm. person. Even though you couldn't say that about him because he's an anthropologist. No, so, I saw I, I saw the video. He put it right there where the, right. the ball joint is. He he did it perfectly. Yeah. And if you just do the math, the average femur for a five foot eleven person is about nineteen inches. Nineteen and a half inches, maybe. Now Shaquille O'Neal's femur. March sixth. What what? is 21 inches maximum it, at most at most this would be if he's very disproportionately long in the thigh region he'd have a 22 inch femur mm -hmm. now now that femur that he's holding in my eyes was a minimum of 23 inches i've had a, a laborer tell me that he thinks it's 25 inches but mm -hmm. almost everyone says that's about 24 inches. And that's what it looks like. That's consistent with what they were pulling out of the mounds and the swamps and bogs of Florida in the crystalline springs a uh, hundred years ago. It's consistent and, and with I, I can give a frame of reference because I've I've met Shaquille O'Neal. He's by far the largest person I've ever met. And I've like lived like I've been around absolute monsters. My locker mate was named Flozell, the hotel, like he was six foot seven and a half, 345 pounds. Like I've been around monsters and Shaquille O'Neal, like my palm, because I used to do scouting. My palm is an eight and three quarters, like my, my reach on my hands. My whole hand would fit inside of Shaquille O'Neal's palm. And so if he had a 21 inch femur and these guys have these 25, 26, I mean, they're, they're eight foot plus. Like, I mean, that's just, that would be a literal giant, especially if you're a French Huguenot. The Huguenots were what? Like five foot? <laughs> you're muted. Sorry. The Spanish were really short. When the Spanish showed up, Juan Ponce de Leon was like four foot 11. Uh, the the French Huguenots of Protestant blood were a little a little bit taller than that, and I have good evidence to show that the tallest man with the Huguenots in 1562 1564 was about six foot three. Okay. So these guys these guys weren't like midgets. The Spanish were a little shorter because they were much more, you know, they were Catholic. They had more Roman blood, more North African blood. Mm -hmm. They were a little, they were considered like pot bell, pot bellied and, and shorter. The yeah. Spanish were the Huguenots. It's like at Central that time, America. <laughs> yeah. The, Fr the French Huguenots at that time, they were largely, believe it or not, Irish and German, or at least Gaelic, Celtic descended and German, you know, France, Frankish. These guys were German. And I remember going through a German Oktoberfest in New Orleans. I was walking through Oktoberfest in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm six, you know, six one, six two with my shoes on, and walking through Oktoberfest in New Orleans, I was short. Okay, mm -hmm. every guy there was six foot tall. Everyone there was six and a half feet tall. Dutch, German, Austrian, you mm -hmm. know, and they were all at this uh, beer house that they all had memberships to. They were actual Germans. It's such a boost from the yeah. average American city just going into a place like that and the French Huguenots of then were probably taller than the than the modern French today because they were being ethnically um, isolated from the rest of the French mm. and had a lot more German and Celtic blood in them but so they were pretty tall. They weren't as short as the Spanish. Those, it's a you know something that needs to be cleared up is the Europeans weren't just short. Um, mm -hmm. 
the Calusa, for example, were also tall, but you never hear, they weren't really said to be nine feet tall. The Calusa were said to be, you know, six foot, seven foot, which is tall, super tall, but they were more muscular. Mm -hmm. Calusa were considered to be, and that's Southwest Florida. The Toco Baga were said to be very tall, seven foot and thin. The Temucua, a lot of people, a lot of the sources all say, no, way over seven feet. And Bentz wasn't, you know, he didn't have YouTube. He wasn't watching YouTube back then. This was like 2007. YouTube, you know, just kind of started getting popular. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's this, you know, 50-year-old preacher. He went there, met with the museum director. We're seeing giants. And then starts getting told about the human sacrifice, the firstborn sacrifice. And the Tamukua were unique for that. Not many Native Americans did that. And in my research, the Tamukua are the only people who are documented, witnessed, and there's evidence from where they're from with like cut bones and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where we can be pretty certain this isn't just like the Spanish and French saying bad things about them. The French were actually super religiously tolerant. Uh, the French Huguenots coming over there, that's what we're told they were escaping, you know, going for religious, uh, religious freedom. Mm -hmm. And when they got there, they saw the Temucua sacrificing their firstborn children to the chief. Oof. Not just not just uh, their enemies. That's what Tim Benz points out, too. He's like, you know, some stuff like this you might see after a battle or one tribe clears out another tribe in a battle. This was different. This was one tribe sacrificing their own children mm. to their own chief and their, their own gods, all internal. Uh, no malice. It was all purely religious, purely mm. ceremonial. And... It was an honor. It was actually, you know, th I'm adding on to this now with, you know, my, yes. my knowledge of Florida history. He doesn't say this uh, next part, but that was one of the ways that there was two castes in Florida, ancient Florida. There was the royal races, and then there was kind of the, the surf class, a lot of which was transgender, believe it or not, LGBT. Yeah, Floridian origins to all that stuff too. Uh, videos on that coming up soon. Ancient Floridian origins of the LGBTQ agenda. <laughs> oh yeah, it's not, you love not you love sneak you love sneaking in that Q because I know the you got the Q in the Tamukua. Yeah. Now you got the the Q at the end of the LGBTQ. So no, uh, dude, like we were we were saying that it's funny. I was trying to make a joke out of that. LGBT Mukua, like uh, <laughs> that's great, yeah. that's good, yeah. Um, so, so, bro, let's. I I was blown away about I guess it was like 16 17 years ago when I first like befriended my first like real Mormon who really believed in the Mormon faith, and he yeah. was telling me all about the 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 generation, the genesis of the Mormon faith. And I think what was it, Adam Smith and all this and how they were one of the lost tribes. And I found it very fascinating, but I didn't really, you know, it, it wasn't anything I explored, you know, I just thought, Oh, that's a pretty cool story. But now when you, when you layer it, like you've, for those of, for the people out there that don't know, you're like Mr. Atlanta, Atlantis was Tampa Bay. <laughs> Or the 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 Atlantis was essentially the kingdom of Atlantis was on the west coast of Florida. Um, the water was probably a little bit lower than it is now. The Gulf of Mexico, which gives the Gulf Stream that warms all of Europe, you know, it's like the perfect push off point if you're going to have this this incredibly enlightened civilization with these massive stone anchors. I'm giving a very brief synopsis of the whole thing. But your push, the first time I heard you was on uh, Tripoli, where you were like, you were laying it out there that Atlantis was essentially centered in Tampa Bay. 
and you made so much sense. Like the, the fertile crescent of the world is, you know, the Gulf, the, the Gulf of Mexico. It definitely, I mean, everything from the flag with the, with the crescent moon and the star there, which is Cuba to, to it actually being the bread basket, like how much food is produced in that region of the world relative to what we're told is the fertile crescent in the Middle East. Like you were hitting all these points. So in my mind, it was like, okay, we're linking up some of the Mormon uh, tradition. You have this great, you know, you're talking about all these uh, Christians at the turn of the 20th century that were like, go for woods from this, from this river in North Florida, like making excellent connections. And so now we have the Tamukua or Tamukua that are, bam. They're Canaanite. They're another biblical, or could be, I should say, allegedly, um, this other aspect or this other tribe, that biblical tribe that is in in North America. This is getting very compelling now. Now we have th at least three, like three data points that make a lot of sense to to say yeah. that you know, North America was actually the cradle of civilization before some sort of cataclysm. Yeah, I always say, um, I know I would bank my money on at least one race or iteration of humanity being, being uh, started in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, whether that's all of humanity, I don't know that for sure. Whether that's, you know, which race that is, I don't know for sure. But I think the evidence is there. Um, when you combine the works of E.E. E. Calloway, John Saxer, um, and the whole Mormon church, you know, just to give a rundown, um, that was a great summing up you did. Uh, the Mormon church is kind of predicated on the belief that ancient Israelites in some form or another, people from Israel, Jerusalem, the Middle East, departed, you know, quickly under kind mm -hmm. of sudden circumstances and went to the Americas. And their whole book is based off of the founding, sorry, the findings of Joseph Smith and a party of his friends who were kind of uh, um, not fossil hunters, but artifact hunters. They dug into mounds. They lived in a very mound rich area up in uh, the Northeast and, you know, New York, Jersey, Ohio, they were active in digging, um, digging artifacts, precious things out of the mounds, mm -hmm. burial mounds, earthworks, and there was a little bit of forgery and quackery and charlatanism going going on. And there was a very ripe religious environment there with a lot of kind of radical preach, preaching going on. Mm -hmm. So Joseph Smith kind of took a lot of the pieces that were around him. And whether you believe it was authentic and earnest and from the heart and 100% pieced together the way he says and everything's true. That might be a possibility or he might have taken pieces of what was around him and, you know, made his own brand of what he thought would be the best version of the truth, making sense of the ancient artifacts they were finding, many of which did in fact have Hebrew writing. That is not just a conspiracy theory. It's not just um, a fringe theory, and it's not just Mormon um, biased archaeology. A lot of this stuff came out before um, the Smithsonian was around. A lot of this stuff was heavily targeted by the Smithsonian. So if the same people who are going after giants and after this and that are going after these Hebrew artifacts, you know, that counts for something. And just all the different places they've been found. Then, so that's just written 
or carved stone or tangible archaeology. They find that all over the United States. And Joseph Smith and his people were stumbling onto stuff like that. So whether they constructed a religion out of that, you know, artificially, or whether they actually unearthed and translated something um, authentic, who knows? But that's where Mormonism kind of gets its uh, gets its critiques and its negative reputation is the whole premise that ancient Israelites had dealings with the Native Americans. And I'm no expert on their history, but that's the gist of it. And it's not unfounded. It's not you ridiculous. Have, you have some incredible videos making the link. Like with the yeah. hair, like, oh my, like, I, I know I had to jump in just because I'm enthusiastic, but like, give a little bit of that tidbit of like how many of these Hasidic qualities, I don't know if it's Ashkenaz, no, it's, his, it's Hasidic, see? Um, like those type of uh, different things that they wore along with the regalia of, yeah. of some of these so, Native Americans. I've got a little slideshow. Do you want me to present? You're a little, you're muted. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So here we've got. Um, This is the Tamuku and stuff I was talking about earlier. And uh, we, we can get back to all this, but we go through all the altars, what the altars might have looked like. But you're asking about the uh, Pileus connections between the um, Native Americans and Florida. This is just a short little not even a slideshow, just a little folder I have on connections between Judaism, ancient Semitic culture, Israelites from the Old Testament, um, Jerusalem, and Florida, and the tribes of Florida, connections between them. So this is the largest and most faithful reconstruction of the tab tabernacle in the wilderness. Ark of the Covenant and Tabernacle in the wilderness, reconstructed in what looks almost like a basketball court in Tarpon Springs, Florida, or near Tarpon Springs, Florida. So, you know, you've got the reconstruction of the reconstruction of the Ark in, what is it, Kentucky? Yes. And then you've got the reconstruction of the Ark of the Covenant in the wilderness with the Tabernacle in Tarpon Springs, Florida. Okay, just checking in there. And uh, Tampa Bay has a rich Jewish history. You know, lots of underground tunneling and things like that. And you can draw connections <laughs> if you if you choose to. But um, just starting off, what's the most striking? And usually I'd end with this because it's the most, uh, it's really the nail in the coffin. Um, no pun double meaning intended, I guess. But the nail in the coffin would be that the natives of Florida, now we don't have any tribe names here because not everyone's into checking dongs, but someone <laughs> noted that the tribes of Florida, the natives of Florida Indians were in fact circumcising. Now we don't know if that's all of them. We don't know if that's only a handful or which tribes, but it was recorded for effect. Multiple places corroborated. And it's not just a fringe theory. This is not just, this is not Mormonism or, you know, old world Florida quackery. This is from the history of circumcision by Peter C. Ramondino. And there's some quotes there on the right. Explorers did in fact encounter it. And it was recorded on numerous occasions in and around Florida circumcision. And that's got to be the most convincing evidence, right? People don't yeah. just circumcise for no reason. You can dress up one way or another because it's fancy. But circumcision really tells one lot from the next. Now, to your point about the headwear, 
I've pointed this out before, you know, I've been talking about the Seminoles for a while and the connection, and a lot of people were quick to point out or kind of uh, complain, hey, those people aren't actually Jewish, or these people aren't actually that, or these people converted from here, and they're not actually them. Hey, you don't know this. You're wrong. You're wrong. Let's just put all that to the side. That's not the point we're trying to make. We're just talking about Semitic related culture, whether someone's com whether someone's claiming to be Semitic, whether they're identifying as Semitic or they aren't Semitic. I'm just drawing the links between the two. So suck my balls, <laughs> leave it alone. And just by the way, so I made, I made this slide to uh, dispel that, that uh, fallacy that this is, you know, only the wrong tribe is, you know, has a link. Well, on the left there, those are modern, you know, Orthodox or Jewish gentlemen. And in the middle there is ancient Semitic headwear. So we have mm -hmm. modern times, which may or may not be a, you know, corruption of, of someone else's faith. I don't know. Doesn't, that's not what we're trying to say right now. But just for context, ancient Semitic peoples did wear hats, hats like this too. And that exact statue is referenced in the Seminoles of Florida by Minnie Moore Wilson, which was released around 1900, somewhere around there, maybe 1920s-ish, around there, turn, turn of the century. Um, Minnie Moore Wilson remarked on the similarities between Israelites and the Seminoles, and she lived with them for a couple of years and got mm -hmm. to know them. And the, they came over to her, her uh, birthday and her house and they sent her, uh, they sent her domesticated egrets as, as you know, gifts and stuff. Very, very cool. But she points out, yeah, the hat is the same as ancient Semitic people, Assyrian, you know, Babylonian ruling class used to wear hats like this too. And you could say this is, you know, not even cultural. This is just what uh, people who worship Saturn uh, do, but you know, moving on, that's just the headwear. There's so much more to this. Um, other types of headwear again, this could just be a fad of, of a certain decade, but on the left, Semitic Hoitia hats, on the right, seminal men wearing their hats. Now, I think the skirts and the rest, you know, the vests and the skirts kind of give it context and really show there is something more to this. It's not just a um, hat that was famous across the world at that time. This is just one more link. We're not resting the whole case on this picture. It's just mm -hmm. a further link. But then uh, stuff starts heating up here a little bit and it starts coming at us from different angles. This is a little bit more recent, we're told, but if something is etched into stone, try and tell me that it's not ancient. It's going to be ancient. It's going to be ancient, right? Mm -hmm. So here we're looking at Coral Castle on the right. Coral Castle on the right, CC 33. And then on the left, we have what is called a mikvah in Judaism for ritual immersion. And they do this after certain things like menstruation, sex, who knows, other you know, reasons for ritualistically washing. Uh, believe it or not, I had a rabbi told me that when they do a conversion, do you know this? When you convert to Judaism officially, you have to do so through blood. And you're actually walked into one of these mikvahs and they prick the tip of your prick with a needle. No, no. Yep. I I might be spilling some beans I'm not supposed to on that one, but I got told that by a rabbi. So a, a Jewish week, baptism. A so that's like a that's to become that's like a Jewish baptism. That's, that's like how you convert, and that's how you convert if you're too old to be circumcised, which most people are when they convert from another religion. In order to be actually 100% Jewish, considered, you have to get a prick 
draw a little tiny bit of blood from your penis with a prick inside the mikvah and literally have your dude swear to god i just got told yeah. that hasn't happened to me and uh, hopefully it won't but that's what you're, the you're not thinking of converting are you because i mean you feel like what you're do you like, mean you feel like you're like a strong goy to me i don't need to convert uh, christopher was... Topher, i am jewish no you're not what do you are mean you? Hmm? no you're not you are what all christians are jews isn't that what they say in the history te textbooks oh god oh geez no, 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 I, no. I, uh, what's the yeah, definition yeah. of a hebrew well i may not be jewish but i am a hebrew what's the definition yeah, he of, of hebrew to be a Hebrew, don't you have to be within the lineage of that that particular tribe? No, I'm a pure, pure-blooded Hebrew. Okay, Hebrew means Irish. Nice. Irish. Do you know where the word Hebrew comes from? It is the ancient Greek, 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 Greek. I got it. Is it better now? Yes, it is. Was it looping? Yeah, it was looping on Greek. Like you were just hitting the Greek. The IDF, the IDF uh, scrambles scrambles my uh, signal every time I get the uh, spicy topics. So you can this hear is me the okay? real attack on Israel right now. Longo is attacking Israel by saying the Hebrews are are Irish. Hebrew, the ancient Greek word, the word Hebrew comes from the ancient Greek word for Irish. Heber means irish the greeks called the ancient irish the celts the gauls the hibernians the hebarians mm -hmm. hiberia hibernia mm -hmm. heber this is why when you make your way from greece to ireland you have to pass through gibraltar right gibraltar gibberish if something's gibberish that means it sounds like it's uh Hebrew to you, gibberish. Mm -hmm. G goes silent, or you inhale your G in many languages. Heber, so Geber, Gibraltar, becomes Heber. And you guys, yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Hebrew, Gibraltar. Okay. Well, so, then you start going time to. Out, time out. I got, I got yeah. to ask you this because I know you've brought this up and I've heard this from other people have hypothesized that the British Isles was originally where the Edomites were. So are, are the, the, the Hebers, the, the, the Hebrew that has nothing to do with a tribe, right? Like the Edomites were, I'm, I'm, the, I forget my biblical cosmology, but the Jews of today are originally um, partially Irish. The, the, the two people in the world today that have the most red hair are the Irish and Scottish today together as one people. Right. And the Jews, the Jews. Mm -hmm. Growing up in high school, the only two people who had red hair were the Irish girls and the Jewish girls. And Jewish girls actually get like this red, red hair, like not even orange, like red. Yeah. Hair. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. So where did they get that from? Well, long time ago in a different land, in a different age, they were partially Aryan, Irish, you know, or originally. 
they've done a lot of mixing and uh, you know interbreeding incest and things like that their words not mine their gene pools constricted to a small small you know tight group at different mm -hmm. times in history and they've been com compelled to incest um, and basically there are whole different people now but they're still clinging to Celtic traditions not even realizing they are far removed druids far removed you know priests of this corrupted um, blood bloodthirsty uh, bloodthirsty corruption of ancient Irish religion mm -hmm. and every bit of it goes back to Irish fertility cult um, druidic magic do you have the understanding that the Edomites were didn't Edomite actually translate to the red ones or or, or being red somehow no I don't I don't do much research on that word particularly but I do know in uh, I do know in Scotland it's the only country in the world that's never persecuted the Jews and in fact, when things get tough in many countries in Europe, the Jews retreat to Scotland. And that's where Freemasonry was created, you'll notice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where men first, uh, I don't know about first, but started wearing skirts because someone told them it was fashionable. Um, and they're Just like backpacks. the Seminoles. Now, good point. <laughs> good point. Yes, precisely. Now, I'm not a big fan of the skirts. That's a little bit of a LGBT deception. But the bagpipes of Scotland are closest in sound and function to the shrill pipes of ancient Babylon and the Israelites. And they didn't always have a bag attached to them, but the pipes, shrill oboes, you know, Jews love oboes. <laughs> For some reason and this goes back to those <laughs> celtic those celtic pipe traditions mm -hmm. so it's they're distant cousins you know one is like a mis misguided corrupted you know bloodthirsty very keen on conquering and and financially well, here's a uh, dude. I like you're you're releasing some of my family karma because um, my my grandfather Perry from Scotland, who was a, I think he was. My grandmother told me he was a Knights Templar. It was her great grandfather, so I don't even know what that would be for me. Um, they ran slaves through South Carolina, and South Carolina was they had a tea plantation gardener tea and it was kind of funny because they weren't related to the bomb gardeners which is what my name is actually derived from but the perrys from from scotland they actually ran a tea company called gardener tea company and they it was very well known that south carolina charleston south carolina was like the jewish hub of all hubs and they like they were coming straight from scotland like that's that's like the Scotland to South Carolina route. So there's some like direct historical narrative of that connection. One second. Oop. That sounds like a sounds like a cat's going crazy over in the in the bookstore. So it's it's very interesting. Um, I have had friends. I've always had a fascination with Savannah, Georgia, and Charleston, South Carolina. Not so much um, that I would ever want to live there, but I kind of feel like this familial, like karmic energy with that. And it was like I know from friends of mine that lived in Charleston and just outside of Charleston, South Carolina, that especially around the turn of the 20th century, the Jewish population there was probably like the densest, one of the more dense Jewish populations in all of North America. Um, it's kind of funny being from South Florida. Like I, I ended up going to like a, it essentially it was a Jewish prep school. There was only five of us boys, but like the, this connection, you back? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Mike. Yeah, my cat 
there's a cad that hangs out on the street and he was like uh you know teasing my cat through the window and they were popping off at each other the hard streets but, uh, of lake worth dog hard streets dude yeah but um you know whatever we were talking about whatever uh Jewish mikvah on the left, ritual immersion. On the right here, Coral Castle. So you guys tell me, is that a mikvah or what? That's Pretty about much. waist waist high, shoulder high water at the bottom there. That's he carved that into the bedrock of Florida. Chose that spot for very specific reasons. And basically, Lee, Lee Scanlon did that with laser beams from his eyes, bro. Lee yeah, Scanlon that's a. Uh, that's a Tartarian black people uh, poop technology. Uh, poop fumes, free energy tech all over this place. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, this was all whitewashed and uh, cor cor corporatized, guys. This used to be a, a Moorish free energy um Moorish free energy poop fume palace. <laughs> yeah. Bathroom, yeah. Bathroomless Star Wars palace. There we go. Gasification. Yeah. Humanure. A humanure gasification plant. We got it. So just so to further pin this down, that this isn't just a random association, he kind of left us some signatures in the Coral Castle. Uh, there's th at least three Star of David's carved into the coral castle and two of them actually uh, complete this ritual washing um, uh, dynamic is you've got the ritual immersion down there in, in the castle or sorry in the bedrock itself you can immerse yourself into the water which is known as the mikvah and then they've got the hand wash and this is to me, proven as a link with by the fact that both of the hand washes have a Star of David in them. The one on the right has a Star of David in it. The one on the left is shaped into a Star of David. And these are for washing your hands, much like the mikvah or the star staircase. Oh, by the way, where do we get the word stairwell from? You know, you can say staircase, but what's a stairwell? There it is. That's so perfect. That's right. perfect. This is a stairwell. Awesome. Stairs into the well. And you might say that you're... Go down here for some reflection. Yes? Right. To, po to ponder something. Mm -hmm. The pond. To get in the pond. Wow. So a little sensory deprivation if you wanted to. Maybe a little Joe a little Joe Rogan little Joe Rogan session, that bad boy. Hey, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna attribute all sensory deprivation to that little little punk. Um yeah. So uh that's the hand wash. Three star of David's carved into the coral castle. He was uh, Eastern European. I don't no, he if he was Jewish, but he was, um, you know, had Masonic ties. Let's just uh, chase this down a little further. You have the matrilineal descent or matrilineal kinship by the Seminoles and Orthodox Jews of today. Mm -hmm. Just another link. Um, you know, Florida really gets treated like it's the Jewish Holy Land. It they sure does. they manicure it and landscape it as if it's going to be here forever, and they're going to spend their you know uh, messianic golden age free from goyim, not in Israel but in Florida. It seems like it seems like they're perfectly fine with letting Israel get turned into a parking lot um, by f you know f fourteens and f twenty twos and whatever they're flying out over there, but. Ne uh, what's this guy's name? Uh, Madis Yahoo. Just kidding. Nen Yahoo's son was shipped over to Florida for safekeeping. That's pretty damning. Not only for the war effort, but just, hey, 
what does it say about the land? Not only is he escaping the danger, but that land's not worth staying on and fighting for. No, he's partying it up in Florida. So that's an attitude that many of them hold. It's not just one guy. Um, then you have places like, I'm sure you know, Topher, mm -hmm. sure you passed through. Yep, I've been uh, there. Bow Harbor. That's a small little neighborhood near Miami Beach. Bow Harbor. They don't have a good explanation for where that one comes from. I bet not. They claim this comes from Bay to Atlantic. No. Bay to Atlantic. That was the kind of slogan they chose. And to roll it off the tongue, they claim they said B from Bay, A to Atlantic, and then L just Oh, there's an L in Atlantic. <laughs> I, I swear. They said Bay to Atlantic. Fall Harbor. No, there, there's some sacrifice going on down there. With all due respect, I would never have been making these connections on my own because I love Jewish people. I love Florida. I don't like, uh, you know, raking anything any muck any <laughs> raking any muck up that doesn't need to be raked but uh you guys pay attention to the news recently this isn't just like um random associations uh israel's gearing up for a mass sacrifice event on the world stage they've built a ramp a altar and they're going to a horned altar like the canaanites used and they're going to sacrifice or at least burn cows that have been sacrificed now why didn't the red heifers actually come from Iberia like come from Ireland that's what that's the mystery I want to know well they came from Texas and it just so happens they came from a spot underneath where the eclipse went so you could say the first eclipse went over the spot that the that the cows were from and then this recent eclipse is going over the spot um well, at least timed for this new eclipse. They're taking cows that come from the place where the last eclipse crossed over, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So they're kind yes. of, they were alive and present during the last eclipse in Texas, and that might increase their spiritual value, Ooh. you could say. And the red heifer, what? I know the eclipse increased my spiritual punyas. I got the eclipse nice. footage right here, dog. It was brilliant, man. It was like, have you ever experienced a full solar eclipse? Yeah, I was in a, uh, I was in um, Texas for the, jeez, in Texas <laughs> for the uh, fucking cat outside. <laughs> The one, the, the one outside likes me so much. It wants me to hang out with, with it. So it it's not get, going away. It wants to get in the chat, dog. Yeah. Few noises are as annoying as cats fighting. Yeah, they seem like they've settled down. So yeah, so, you were here. talking about this your eclipse action. Like what what where where did you experience a full solar eclipse? Texas, and then I caught uh, the majority of one in Florida when I was valeting cars. A eclipse happened. I think that's the one that Trump was staring at. Um, oh, that's twenty seventeen, cool. I think. Oh, so it was a partial in Florida then, right? Or was it? I full? believe. I don't know if it was full, but I saw a full one in Texas in October. That was, you know, I don't know if it's technically a full eclipse, but it was a total eclipse and it was annular. So it was the ring of fire. Right. Saw that one in Texas under the direct path of totality at an astrological conference. It was Robert Phoenix. Right. So here, Bal Harbor just happens to be a upscale Jewish community. And you guys know about Surfside, like the uh, 
Surfside, Miami. You ever hear about the the building that collapsed in its own footprint very suspiciously? Yeah. That the uh, Israeli you know, special forces responded to. Well, that was um, Surfside, which is uh, right up next to Bell Harbor. They're pretty much one and the same. Mm-hmm. Very upscale Jewish com- community. Um, like I said, no hate, no uh, attributions of uh, wrongdoings here other than what they're claiming to do in the news already out in the open. They're doing in front of. So I'm not attributing anything here that they're not proudly doing out in the world stage. Yeah, I mean, let, let's just like look that. at the actions. Like, let's like let's like let's be merit. Let, let's have a, a meritocracy here. Like people yeah. can say one thing and then do a total other. It's it's the actions that matter. So, um, yeah, I, I I don't get any bad vibes from you in in the in the direction of the of the Jew circumcised Florida. <laughs> this is a little slogan that this uh, you're gonna see how God works here, how God's <laughs> God's foremost language is. Humor, comedy, comedy, <laughs> and what what did Freud teach us, if anything, that the language of the unconscious and subconscious mind is puns and yes. dirty humor, dirty jokes and puns is what the site what our own psychology consists of. Now you can disagree with his conclusions. I do myself, but this is a little slogan that who what team of all teams the seminoles of florida came up with against their miami enemies circumcised florida just the tip now isn't that a funny connection well isn't it funny too that the hurricanes were called the canes like two ball cane like (laughs) like here we go yep and this is what uh, Bell Harbor, North Miami looks like. Uh, rich Jewish history in Florida. They came to Florida earliest in some of the greatest numbers, considering uh, compared to the rest of America. Um, moving on, you know, Ebor City is so Jewish that they paved a good portion of it in hexagonal, uh, hexagonal tiles sponsored by the Jewish American Society for Historic Preservation. And again, tunnels all over Ebor and Tampa. And yeah, it's, you know, very out in the open. It's very rich Jewish history. Well, uh, Ben Shapiro came to Florida to have his son have his bris ceremony. (laughs) Just thought I'd throw that in there. In Boca Raton. Boca Raton. He lives in the neighborhood I used to live in. So we're Eskimo bros. Same igloo. Oh, um, man, I know Boca well, very well. Just back to the ritual immersion. This kind of slide right here, if you want to pause on it, guys, read the whole thing. We're not going to, but it just kind of shows the similarity, not only in what I was showing you with the... Uh, Coral Castle uh, bath. But, yeah. Native Americans would ritualistically cleanse themselves in the exact same fashion as ancient Israelites. Native Americans and ancient Israelites. Same philosophy when it came to water and ritual immersion. Those are some tunnels in Miami. Here's a little thing I like to play. This is a comedian who's been doing some rounds talking about Palestine and stuff. Let me know if you can hear it. You might not be able to hear it. Can you hear it? No. All right. Well, whatever. It's basically a comedian. This guy's name. I don't, I forget his name. Yusuf or something. (laughs) Or, uh, you know, I forget his name, but he basically says, uh, 
you know, he's posed the question, where can the Palestinians go? And he says, you know, uh, they don't need to go anywhere. What about the Israelis? Where can they go? They can go somewhere. They can go to Florida. And Piers Morgan's like, uh, he didn't really know what to say. And <laughs> it just kind of hit home. Uh, what did, you know, Jews like to golf? The Seminoles of Florida. Some of the earliest Native Americans invited to golf. And there he is in his full regalia. His Scottish kilt. Seminole man. Yep, the uh, most famous Seminole in American history was uh, named William Powell, better known as Osceola. He mm. was, according to some, half Scottish. There you go. Chief Osceola. Right There's there more the golfing. Of... Bows and golf going hand in hand. That's something else that happened. That's something that happened on Jekyll Island, too. You made Here's... the best. Can it... Look, hold on with the golf, dude. Sure. When you talked about the ball going into the underworld, that was like epiphany for me. Like, so for the like your your expose on what these golf courses are actually covering like the landscaping and how these are used and like how you have to be in the club to play golf at a lot of these places can you just give a little bit of context of that for people yeah so <clears throat> when you're studying like i kind of call it like the jekyll island formula you know, okay, the rich and powerful are interested in native culture. Why? What are they drawing from it? You know, um, building their houses on top of burial mounds, something you see time and time again. Uh, we all know that burial mounds were largely incorporated into golf courses, especially in Florida, where the ground is so flat. Uh, developers seized upon land with um, land with uh, mounds on it, earthworks, shell middens, developers seized on them, whereas they had hitherto been considered like bad land. Like if something had uh, burial mounds on it, oh no, you can't really develop it. It's going to be really hard. Well, here comes golf, and wow, there's a perfect use for all the burial mounds across the eastern United States. You know, mm -hmm. the hills, the change in elevation the interesting shapes that's perfect for golf. It's absolutely perfect. But then you get into these kind of spiritual things. It's not just utility uh, for the elevation. There's a spirituality to golf. Uh, most men who golf have or will at some point, you know, smoke cigars when they're doing it. Men who don't really use tobacco at all will are more likely to engage in it when they're golfing. It kind of compels that behavior. And that's another link to Native Americans, tobacco, of course. Uh, if you want to get real particular, the Tamukua and the Tokabaga from, ta from uh, Tampa Bay were some of the earliest people recorded to be smoking tobacco through big, long pipes and they had a you know rich tradition of doing it. It wasn't just like some of these Caribbean islands where they'd smack some leaves together and smoke them through their hand. They had really nice carved pipes and designs, and it was religiously integrated. Um, but blah, blah, blah. Golfers like to smoke. Then there's the element of clubs, like you were kind of saying. Um, there's a shot in the Jekyll Island video of John D. Rockefeller holding the club over his shoulder, his golf club over his shoulder in the exact same fashion that a Tumukua chieftain is holding his war club as he's walking out down a big, long kind of war field. And the uh, head of the golf, sorry, the white golf ball is not unlike the head of a young infant being yeah, as terrible it is to say, sacrificed with a club. Samukio would use a club in sacrifice and execution. The word golf means club. Um, a lot of the 
hills used in golf courses are burial mounds. Well, golf itself is perhaps the only sport that incorporates subterranean with the underworld. Mm -hmm. You could inf you could uh, infer it's the only sport that includes the underworld. You penetrate the realm between above and below. The ball falls into the underworld. And the T, when you go up to T off for the very first time, you're usually on top of a little mound, a platform. Um, just to drill this point home, well, Donald Trump even buried his wife on a on a golf course. So to this day, there's still kind of burial mounts. And just look around. Jekyll Island has a golf course called Indian Mound Golf Course. There's places like that in New Hampshire, Ohio, West Virginia, uh, you know, which are named like Indian Mound Golf Club, Indian Mound Golf Course, uh, Burial Mound Golf Course, all across America. And then there's um, slave burials too, or whatever you want to call them, African American burials. A lot of the time, those are there too on golf courses. Do you know? Because golf originated in Scotland, apparent, like supposedly. So there's yep. this other, like you know, connection that you have from, yep, the British Great Isles, point. you know, coming down into into Florida. Then we also have. You know, it's essentially the Gulf Stream that originates inside the Gulf of Mexico, essentially keeps the British Isles and the rest of the Europe, you know, more temperate than it would be normally given its its longitude. So it's it's really crazy this connection that you have from the fertile crest, the real fertile crescent of the southern United States and Central America going up towards you know like you have pointed out in your work all the way up to finland um but this this connection with golf specifically between like i i've been to saint i played saint andrews in scotland um <laughs> and obviously living in florida i played a, a ton of golf even though i hated it um there it's a wonderful connection that you've made and plus like georgia per capita i've never met more like freaking golf craze people than like the the goy up in georgia like that that was like that's a that's a favorite pastime in that area too yeah um it's yeah it's a huge huge connection you've got um <laughs> you've got uh the masters is not far from there in augusta georgia true true the golf capital of the world, the global world headquarters for the PGA is in St. Augustine, I believe. No, no, sorry, it's Ponte Vedra. Global PGA world headquarters. World golf headquarters is in Ponte Vedra, Florida, northeast Florida, mm. near St. Augustine. Then the World Golf Hall of Fame and World uh, Golf Hall of Fame and World Village, which is separate from the global headquarters of golf. The that's PGA. Then the Golf Hall of Fame, which is separate from the PGA, that is in St. Augustine. They just opened up a new place, but they've been in St. Augustine for decades. So golf headquarters, Florida, Northeast Florida, Temecula territory, the same territory that Jekyll Island is. Jekyll Island is the Northern extent of that territory. Tampa Bay is the Southern extent of that territory. So that's the golf capital of the world, yeah, Northeast Florida. And when you, when you consider playing capital, like the capital of playing golf, that is Naples, Florida considered um but just as a whole florida is the golf capital of the world we we uh have um license plates that proudly you know declare that it's somewhat of a state slogan 
golf capital of the world. So between St. Augustine, Ponte Vedra, Augusta, Georgia, Jekyll Island, lots of golf history in Jekyll Island too. They redeveloped the golf ball and the golf shaft in Jekyll Island officially. So between Augusta, Jekyll Island, Ponte Vedra, St. Augustine, PGA, which is Jupiter, you know, North Palm Beach, Florida, between there and Palm Beach and Boca Raton and, you know, up and down Tri-County, Palm Beach, Dade, Broward, and Southwest Florida, Naples, and all those ritzy areas. It's by far the golf capital of the world. Florida has the most golf courses of any state by far. So there's a big connection here. All the wealth loves golf. Why does the wealth love golf? Well, it's relaxing. Yes, it connects you to nature. Yes. Yes, you're a little bit grounded with your spikes. If you're lucky enough to be using metal spikes through your shoes, you're a little grounded too. That's not it. What a lot of the businessmen probably don't get enough of and why they crave it. But you've also got your cart girls. Sure. That's a, you know, a draw. But ultimately it's this kind of assuming of like a native culture it's almost like a broadway or like a theater like a charade where you're kind of charading native like marching on the war path with your buddies it's a little bit of a mix of a war march with your buddies from one end of a, a field to the end it's also got a little bit of uh, a little bit of what the native the indians actually used to play in the southeast united states is lacrosse lacrosse was ultimately like a big long um capture the flag game almost it wasn't so much like soccer rules like our lacrosse basketball and hockey is today it was a little bit more like cross country, uh, cross country capture the flag, mm. kind of. And golf is a little bit like that, isn't it? It's a little bit like polo and capture the flag, and all these pieces kind of went into golf. Um, you know, cricket went one direction, but baseball went one direction, but golf, golf's direction also kind of stemmed out of a little bit of this Native American history. Now, why the Scottish? Well, the Scottish and the Irish, and the Irish have, uh, what do they call it? Not curling. Um, they have another name for it. It's close to something like that, where they have they have like a field hockey, the, I the Irish do. So they have iterations of this lacrosse-like game. I grew up playing lacrosse. Um, lacrosse is huge in Florida, but there's something to this. There's a Native American element to golf in the way that it's played uh, itself, not just where it's played. So all the elements to it point to a Native American connection. I would like to like talk about how maybe the ka, like the the element of the essence that's left in the bones of of the the remains in these mounds whether it was in jekyll island where you know you had the more potentiated <laughs> ka of the kabbalah but that's like from the the egyptian standpoint which a lot of us in this chat or this um stream believe like the Egypt, like the Nile River, was actually mirrored in the Mississippi. So there's something to that. But the the Ka of the Kabbalah or the, the Ka energy, the essence energy that stays with the physical, if you have a very potentiated person or a potentiated situation at the time of death, that energy will emanate, right? Yeah. And you made the correlation that, okay, they're doing this, the, the Rockefeller essentially has his, his sitting room <laughs> over the, the ceremonial ground where they're sacrificing their firstborn children. That's a highly, highly potentiated energy. And then they're anchoring debt 
Like they're literally saying, you all will be debtors with this energy. And then their, their foot soldiers, which today is all white collar. What does the white collar, you know, where, where does most industry of the white collar get done? It gets done on the golf course. Yes. It gets done at the club. Yep. Like you were saying, at the club, in the golf course. It's not being done yes. in boardrooms. Yeah. The, the men whose who's, uh, simple type, typing of emails, you know, shift oceans across continents, right? Men whose emails affect great change in other continents mm -hmm. don't spend their time on their phone all day, picking up the no. phone at, at their office. They spend the day, they choose who they want to spend their day with, they take them to go golfing, and they spend the whole day in relative privacy and, uh, you know, fraternity with these uh, business partners, and they hack it out on the golf course. And you made a good point, you know, the, the decisions are being made. It's not the pencil pushers, it's the golf swingers. Yes. who are it's the club, the club swingers, swingers who are um you know pulling the strings and it's there that many of the decisions are being made officially and the unofficial how many pictures or movies do you see where it's you know hey they they don't hash it out till they get onto the golf course and then boom that that handshake happens on the golf course they get that unofficial under the table bro to bro you know, handshake, the human element comes through on the golf course and they get the deal done. We've all seen that in movies and TV shows where, you know, the conference room wasn't enough. They take it to the golf course and it, and it works out. Um, you've also got the, uh, uh, it's not just business. What was George Bush and many and every uh, president, the two presidents before him and the two two presidents after him, what have they been criticized so much for? Spending too much time on the golf course. Now, you could even argue you were talking about the Gulf Stream, golf, golf, the Gulf Stream. You know, the golf capital of the world that we were just talking about, northeast Florida, is the exact spot where the Gulf Stream is the Gulf Stream the Gulf Stream, guys? I don't know. It's starting to look like that. Uh, the, why are those words so hard to distinguish from each other? I think there's a reason. Mm -hmm. um, Gulf Stream makes its right hand turn across the Atlantic right there by St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. That's why it's the Treasure Coast, the Gold Coast. Um, all this, the ships would come right up across, right up along the Florida border sorry, the Florida coast up to the Georgia border, and then boom, take a right-hand turn across the Atlantic. So that's why the Gulf Stream is kind of, it has an anchor point right there at Northeast Florida. It has another anchor, anchor point over here where I am, where it pinches between Bimini and the mainland. Mm -hmm. That's why this, this area is so unique and why Edgar Casey. And Graham Hancock are saying Bimini, Bimini, because the Gulf Stream slithers in between Bimini and Palm Beach, right where Trump lives, right where my you know store is, right over here, right where the most Finnish people outside of Finland live, is this little spot where the Gulf Stream comes up, also a big golf hub. So the Gulf, Gulf, but the connection, the further connection that I'm going to make here is the Gulf War was largely fought from the golf courses of Florida. Definitely. Fact. The Gulf War was fought in you know the Persian Gulf, but it was being planned and orchestrated from the Gulf of America, Gulf of Florida, Gulf of Mexico, from the golf courses. In, the, gentle, in gentlemen who did a, did a lot of flying in Gulf Stream jets, do you know yes. where do you know where the private jet airport is for Palm Beach? 
Yes, I do. Where is it? Well, are you talking about like the like the <sighs> the address of it? Like, <laughs> well, what, like what I, city? Palm Beach Island doesn't have its own doesn't have its own um, airport, but Palm Beach Island has a lot of people who fly private jets. Do you know where mm -hmm. most of them, many of them keep their jets? PGA Boulevard? No, it's a good guess. And it's not the Palm Beach International Airport, which is actually in West Palm Beach. So it's right. not those two places. Do you know where they keep their Gulf Stream jets? No, I don't. At the private airport in Atlantis, Florida. Nice. Which is in which is in between, which is uh, right up next to Lake Worth, Atlantis, mm -hmm. right where the Gulf Stream comes closest to mainland America, right here outside of Lake Worth, Palm Beach County. Um, but basically, that, that's off of yeah. uh, like if you were to take Atlantic Ave and like take it out into the ocean, that's where it is, right? If I was to take which Ave? Atlantic Avenue, like yeah. if you're up in Lake Worth, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's a sixth. We have Lake Ave right here. Atlantic Ave. Ave is is Delray. Okay, we have Lake Lake Ave and Lake Worth is Palm Beach. It's what separates Palm Beach from the mainland. Is the body of water called Lake Worth? So I live in Lake Worth. Trump lives in Palm Beach. It's just right across the intercoastal. Mm -hmm which they call Lake Worth. But um, Gulf Streams, Gulf, big connections. We're still ironing it all out. I'm going to have a big golf documentary coming up soon where I'm, you know, going to play, get dressed up and, you know, <laughs> give it a, give it, give it a go from the inside to a Yolt, dude. gonzo journalism. Dude, I was being, I was being groomed to be a country club manager. At, at Michigan State University, where I went to school, my degree in hospitality and finance, like I was like the perfect guy that they could throw into like the country club because I could talk to all the the rich, the rich to do people about football. And I hated mm -hmm. it because guess what? Like I have never seen so many people like all these men that would play golf all day. All they ever did, Longo, was fucking bet each other. Everything was a gamble. They were always having action on something. And I was like, this is absurd. This is like 1998. And I was just like, these are these are the men. These are the titan titans of industry. Very, very disappointing. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, I, I grew up in a golfing community. Most, you know, a lot of people in Florida either do, did grow up in a golfing community or have friends who do, friends who did. Um, it's ever present in Florida is driving around, you know, there's golf courses. It's not always like that in every other state, but in most of Florida, super golfy and you know that's where you'll catch some of the uh, some of the cream of the crop, too, is on the golf course. Um, it's what some of these people do all day, every day. Kid you not, yeah. it's the center, you know, foundation of their lives. Really, so what, tea time. What do you think about the connection, though? Here, like, let's get into the sigil magic that's being used. I don't even know if that's the correct term because I don't do magic. But I hear a sigil is like something that you actually infuse with energy and then you use that in your magical rite. That's the way I understand it. So if you have the remains of a being of, of something that was once living mm -hmm. that carries more power in it, like that's like what they do in voodoo and a lot of uh, Caribbean type of ma magical ceremonies, a lot of uh, African magical ceremonies. And it sounds like... <laughs> that the this Canaanite process of of sacrifice was obviously for a reason. Do you have right. any in, do you have any insight into that aspect of it? Well, I mean, you were saying uh, potential or 
uh, charge, you know, things mm -hmm. can be charged for good or for bad. Um, if I'm going to get married or something like that, I choose a place where that's been done before or similar things have been done before. You know, babies have been blessed. Um, lives have been celebrated. Uh, God has been celebrated. I want to get married there. I want to soak, absorb all that into my marriage, make sure it's all good, mm -hmm. good to go, positive vibes. Um, same things going through the head of someone who wants to do something evil. And it's planning, and, you know, and is planning it out a year ahead of time, like you would a wedding. You can bank on them wanting the same degree of, you know, uh, not only when am I going to do what I'm doing, astrologically timed, you know, whatnot, but where I'm going to do it needs to be uh, hospitable to my undertaking. It has right. to foster has to foster the evil deed, just like the church. I'm getting married where that has been done before. There's uh, there's a forward momentum there. There's a there's a launching had is a blessing that's been successful there already it's a great spot to do it again so that same thing is going to go through the mind of someone planning something evil that far ahead of time right uh, it's planning you know at the very least you want the setting to match the event right now as, as far as absorbing the magic and furthering the success of the evil that they're doing I don't need to be convinced on that being a possibility. But for somebody who maybe says, oh, that's just a bunch of haunting nonsense, you know, oh, yeah, the rich people are just superstitious. They get together and do something in one spot. But, oh, what does it count for? Well, <clears throat> I've been to some haunted areas. You know, I've seen some crazy things. I've had my, I've had, uh, you know, goosebumps. I've been chilled with fear in certain areas certain times in my life i know evil exists and i know that evil builds on evil just like good builds on good right and like i said i don't need to be convinced but at the very least i would i would uh stress to to a non-believer a naysayer that evil builds on evil. And if you don't believe in evil, then you don't believe in evil. But evil builds on evil. And evil places places absorb evil deeds just as much as a church, like I was saying earlier, absorbs good deeds. Yes. And an, an altar where blood has been spilled is ripe for the wrong reasons. And the sadhus of India, let's just you know go through some evidence here. The sadhus of India, though they're not billionaires, are attributed with having great psychic powers. Great, they're able to fortune tell. That's how, actually how they're able to recruit, oftentimes. They, they wouldn't recruit anyone into their brain-eating psycho cult uh, if they didn't, if they weren't able to impress people. And actually, the sadhus can function kind of as like witch doctors or, or voodoo priests in India. For those who don't know what a sadhu is, a sa I shouldn't uh, generalize. Sadhus are like the wandering religious men of India. In America, we call them hobos. In India, they call them sadhus, and they they donate all their money to them, and they say, "Oh, my holy, you know, holy Baba Baba Vishnu, the forty fourth, you know." Agabananda, Dana Bananda, the, you know, the, the 14th, your holiness. Meanwhile, it's just a 7-Eleven hobo in America, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, the sadhus are these holy hobos in India. But there's one sect of them called the Agoris. And the Agoris are left-hand path, deviant, black magic, tantric, you know, cannibals. They eat dead people. They fuck dead people. They have 
all different weird relations with corpses. They hang around the ritualistic uh, funeral pyres mm -hmm. uh, along the Ganges where they actually burn bodies and set them. <laughs> they do this in different um, rivers, major rivers in India. They, they, when someone dies, they literally just push them out into the, the Ganges or mm -hmm. other rivers and they, they drink that water. Or sometimes they'll put them out in a boat and burn the boat, you know, like Viking style. Uh, but a lot of times they'll just burn them on a pyre uh, right next to the water. And then they'll take the ash and throw it into the water. You know, tr traditions vary, but the sadhus, the agori sadhus, the, the bad ones, they'll hang out by the funeral pyres and they'll try and bargain if they can or maybe steal if they don't get their way. Mm -hmm. They bargain with families or, you know, someone shows up dead and family didn't show up. You know, there's uh, unidentified corpse. They bargain and say, hey, let us take this one. You know, or we scrounge together 50 bucks. We'll take this one. And they'll buy a body fresh if they can. The fresher, the better. The younger, the better. The purer, the better. The cleaner, the better. The whiter, the better. I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to God, look it up. They look for pure souls or someone who died doing what they loved or died in a fit of rage. They, like you were saying earlier, they don't care what the type of energy is. And I'm not speaking for them. This is just my shallow, you know, quick uh, understanding of what I've learned through books. And, you know, from here, I've never been to India. But they don't care if it's bad or good, short or bad death. But from what I remember, they prefer a sudden death and strong emotion, a strong charge, yes. whether it was bad or, you know, did they just get married and died? Well, that's good. We'll take it. Or did they just die suddenly in a fit of rage in a five way shooting? Well, we like that too. So they seek out kind of the interesting stories the drama the um charge is the only way you can really say it and you know it's hard to kind of stomach but these guys aren't necessarily evil they believe themselves to be doing like religiously sacred work but mm -hmm. granted that's left hand path they they place themselves on the wrong side of spirituality intentionally believing that it's you know, it's either it's either some of the things that you hear them explaining it is it it burns the karma quicker by being on the other end of the spectrum. Does that make sense? By willfully yes, yes. partaking, willfully partaking of the disgusting, it actually brings them closer in line um, to what is beautiful. Brings them closer to the creator. Uh, I don't eat garbage. I don't bang corpses, so I can't speak 100% to their to their mindset, but this is what they do and kind of what they act like. But uh, they do eat people too, if they get a chance, if there's a fresh body. They try and do everything they can legally, like with consent, from like a reasonable, you know, recently dead corpse from a family. But the Agoris do this stuff, and they super, super, super believe in charge magnetic you know yes. death the imprint of death being greater in some people and they want to harvest that straight out of a corpse look mm -hmm. it up the agoris if they'll take one that is about to be burned they'll steal it if they have to they'll have sex with corpses they'll do all this stuff though they drink out of skulls um Everything, like all the stereotypes people say about India and like probably said about India a hundred years ago, they do. They steal bodies and drink out of corpses and drink out of skulls and do all this stuff. They, dr they drink pee and eat shit. That's probably the best thing they do, right? Drinking pee. Yeah. Drinking pee. <laughs> it's probably the only thing that's keeping them going, eh? Hey, Toe? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I lived in India for a couple of years. I'm sorry. It rubbed off on me. And they eat shit, though, which is not something no. I think people no. should be doing. Never. They 
do intentionally disgusting and disturbing things in order to burn their karma quicker, uh, bring them closer to God by understanding the shadow aspects they say. You know, it's it's kind of very like pretentious and like schizophrenic reasoning, but nonetheless, that's why they do it. And it's worth talking about because there's, you know, we ask about the magnetic charge of a place like Jekyll Island. Well, there's entire religions based off of this premise that you can absorb the, the spark of death from a corpse and use it in your ritual dealings. Mm -hmm. Or you can use the spark of a place, use the, um, the, it's always hard not to sound pretentious and gay and fucking like, you know, Long Island psychic uh, or Long Island medium whenever you talk about this stuff. But they use the psychic imprint of what happened, the rich terror, the uh, the uh, atmospheric adrenochrome, if you want to call it, yeah. you know, the ar architectural the, the saturation of the terror into a place or the fear or they like it. it, it so. so in my practice, like I deal with a lot of people that have stored trauma in their body. And a lot of times that will be in their biofield anatomy. Um, so the terminal, like it's a very real thing. Like we store trauma and we store our memory in the space around us. And then it, yeah. Will actually actuate through the correspondent areas of the body. Yeah. So it's a very, very real thing. You sound like you've been watching some double soul shaman tough. <laughs> Dude, I've been I've lived that world for 20 God, I've been I've now been a polarity therapist and massage therapist for 23 years. So 20, you know you know who double soul shaman is? No, who's that? Just this guy that you sound like you're quoting, but I'm only teasing. It's like your boy Ian, right? Like the guy down in Miami that you sold his place. Like, yeah. It's it's a very palpable thing. Like, you know, linear time and all that. Yeah, we experience linear time. But when you have something, a very high charged emotion, that will create its own impression in the field around you. And we call it a miasm in, in India, they call it a vasana, but it's a very real thing. I mean, clinically they've known about it for like in like yeah. documentation for over 150 years. Like it's yeah. not, a, it's not a mysterious so, thing. So Tov, I, I thought it's gotta be mentioned, you know, with uh, the psychic, Elect electromagnetic imprint of a place being, you know, used in magic yes. afterwards. We've got to talk about, I've got to throw in there, uh, some of, some of the uh, more objective reasons why Jekyll Island would be chosen as a place is the long or the latitudinal evidence. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge, huge connection because Tim Bentz didn't even mention this. He didn't know about this. He had no clue. Timothy Bentz went and was studying the altars, the Tamukua culture, um, with the memory, with the uh, evidence of altars in Jerusalem fresh on his memory. He came to America, went to Jekyll Island, studying all this stuff, started making connections to the Canaanites, all of this stuff, he packed up and went home and gave his interview without ever realizing he, he name-dropped Jerusalem a handful of times. He neglected, you know, no fault of his own. It's, you know, it's hard to figure out. He did not realize that Jerusalem and Jekyll Island are in the same latitude, precisely. 31st degree parallel, precise. You can take, what does that mean? You can take a line from Jerusalem, flat line, uh, parallel with the equator, and it runs from not only where the four rivers of, or the two rivers of Eden split off in Iraq, the exact spot where the two rivers of Eden fork in Iraq, mm -hmm. 
31st degree parallel north. Then it runs across the Middle East to Israel. In Jerusalem, this, the holy city of Jerusalem, plotted precisely on the 31st degree parallel. Then you go, you follow that line without, without deviating at all, straight line across the Atlantic. And where does it take us? Jekyll Island, Georgia is the first piece of land that it touches once it strikes America. Mm -hmm. Literally, as if they were Phoenicians and went from Israel, took the boat across the Atlantic and tried to land on the exact spot just going off of um, Declamation. Uh, exactly, of Polaris. They could literally just say, oh, well, we, we went in a different direction, but we can still land in the same latitudinal zone, same ring around the earth mm -hmm. they, they, they clung to. And by the way, 90% uh, of the world's population lives on the 30th degree parallels, north and south. Uh, about two thirds of the world's population lives in the northern 30th degree parallel. Mm -hmm. So most of earth chooses to live there. It's very Edenic by nature, that, lati that latitude. But you can also see why Jews like Florida so much. Uh, what constitutes the border between Florida and Alabama? The 31st degree parallel north. What mm -hmm. constitutes the border between Florida and Georgia? The 30th degree parallel north. So the little, the panhandle of Florida is the 31st degree parallel north. So mm -hmm. you can see the link between the Holy Land in Israel and the Fertile Crescent in Florida, latitudinal, it's geographic, not just cultural. It's not just and, phonetic. It's not just. And that 31st degree is that where the headwaters of that, that four river system that's talked about in the Bible, yeah. where, the go where the gopher wood came from. Can I show that? Yeah, please. Okay. Let's see if we can do this. This, this should prove the point. Mm. Boom. I think you've got to add it. It's uh, down there. Thank you. We're looking at Florida right here, guys. This is where I am. Palm Beach. Let's just zoom out. Oh, we're on the ball, of course, guys. Flat, flat. <laughs> Uh, not adjusted for the flat truth, but um, we're just going to come over here to the exact spot where the, it's always hard to find, exact spot where the Tigris and the Euphrates split. You ready for this? Yep. You ready to have your mind fucking blown? 31 precisely. You see it? Mm -hmm. 31st degree parallel north precisely. Literally, if you threw a rock in that exact spot, you're hitting the precise spot where the 30th degree crosses into the 31st. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Very explicit. Okay. We see where the, the pin is dropped, right? Now we're just going to come over here to Jerusalem. We're going to click on the city of Jerusalem and oh my gosh, 31st degree parallel north. That shouldn't really surprise us. It's the most hospitable latitude there is in existence to human quality of life. The climate, it's, it's established, it's objective. Humans like this latitude more than anywhere else. But why the precision? Why the precision? Climate Boom. can be universal. Why you know climate can be universal, but the numerology or the uh, the fixation on precision makes me think it's more orchestrated. So, Jekyll Island location, 
31. It's not off by point. You know, it's 31 to the dot. And if you go back to the uh, rivers, it's to the point one. Wow. So 31 degree. Now, you want to know what's pretty crazy? We're just going to go over here. And guess what they call this little neighborhood in Georgia? You see that? Yep. Jerusalem, Georgia. And let's just take a little 30.9 degrees north. This is a little higher. Just a, you know, mm -hmm. 100, yard, 100 yards to the north, 30.99. A little farther north, a little farther north, 31 precisely. 31 degrees parallel north precisely. So Jerusalem literally... Sorry, Jekyll Island is literally like New Jerusalem. I mean, it's more fertile, too. Little island right there, that's Jekyll Island. Uh -huh. So 31 degrees parallel north, right over the Florida border. It's only 25 miles from the Florida border. Right there. And then St. Augustine is, is over here. You know, ancient city, oldest city in America, right down here. Jacksonville, Temecula. State, State Park or National Park right there. Um, well, now let's go across. Remember I was saying the Florida border. See this flat line right here? Yeah. Between Florida and Georgia? That's mm -hmm. the 30th degree parallel. Now, you'll notice the, floor, the border between Florida and Georgia is smack dab between the 30th and the 31st. So now, also we're going to notice in ancient times or not ancient times uh, colonial times florida went from jekyll island to the mississippi river all the way across so the western extent of florida used to be until the creation of texas was the mississippi river florida panhandle went all the way out to the mississippi river that's why that portion of mississippi is flat and in line with the panhandle of Florida. Mm -hmm. So we're going to zoom into this, uh, the FAG region. Are you aware of the FAG region? No, I'm not. The Florida, Alabama, Georgia border. <laughs> this is where FAGs live. Uh, literally. <laughs> this is, if you're an, I'm a, I'm an expert in the in the history of Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, so I'm a fag. Um, <laughs> expert on fags. <laughs> we're going to be zooming in here on why the church has been demonizing the F-A-G word. Um, F-A-G goes back to Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. And this little uh, three three corners spot right here where the three states meet is determined by a very special lake known as Lake Seminole. So, to just reiterate, the borders of Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, and Mississippi, and sorry, and Mississippi, and Louisiana are all determined by Lake Seminole and the 31st degree parallel north. Let's take a look. Zoom out real quick. You'll note that the Florida border starts between starts between the thirtieth uh, and thirty first degree parallel north. Okay, some of the largest um, oak trees known to man are right here in this strip. But nonetheless, when we zoom in on, by the way, the full capital of Florida is uh, you know couple dozen miles away here, Tallahassee. But this is the special spot right here. The four rivers of Eden, shaped like the four fingers of my hand, are right here, and they determine, they constitute the border between Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, the FAG. Mm -hmm. The Lake Seminole, 
which means original, by the way, seminal, seminal undertaking, yeah. sem seminal vesicles. Uh, this is Lake Seminole, named for the Seminoles of Florida. And the southern extent of Lake Seminole, precisely. How did God know where the latitude was? How did Mother Nature know where the latitude was? The southern extent of Lake Seminole is determined by, by chance, the 30th degree parallel north. So the bottom line right here is the 30th degree parallel north. 30th degree parallel north. At the base, the southern extent of Lake Seminole. Now we're going to come up here at the northern extent of Lake Seminole, at the tip of one of these fingers. And why does, you know, Eden and Atlantis are intrinsically linked? How so? Because the four rivers of Eden, well, two of them meet back up in Atlantis. Atlanta. Atlantis. Atlanta. This watershed area is the true Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. Mm hmm Mesopotamia is Mesoamerica. It's the middle between Florida and Georgia. And the watered, well-watered region between the two rivers. It's not the Euphrates and the Tigris. It's, I believe, the Ch Chattahoochee and the Flint River, I believe. I could be wrong on that. Thank God, they, they flooded the Chattahoochee in so many areas to cover all the different Indian remains. Like, you've heard of that, right? Yep, my buddy Jeff uh, talks about that all the time. He's got great uh, firsthand knowledge and evidence of it. But the four rivers of Eden here, Earth's only four-headed river system is positioned right between Florida, Alabama, Georgia. And the northern extent is 31st degree parallel north. The southern extent is the 30th degree parallel north. And that's where you get the borders for Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. That's why it's unique. And if you come across to Louisiana, where the Mississippi is, this line is continued across Mississippi into Louisiana, and it constitutes the border between Mississippi, Mississippi and Louisiana. Because... Like I said earlier, Florida used to go from Jekyll Island to the Mississippi River. And that is West Florida, modern mm -hmm. Louisiana. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Talk about a ley line. Yeah. And you know, in reverse fashion, you know, they always say 13 is unlucky. <laughs> You know, they're, they're using that as a as a reverse sigil with that. That's kind of cool, the encoding with that. Yeah, it's also the last degree before the highest degree of masonry. 31st, 32nd is the highest degree of masonry. 33rd is honorary, not a earned <laughs> degree. So. So where are you at now with your total cosmology now that because i mean by the way this is an excellent like you have the most cohesive explanation of things taking into account uh history that we've been told <laughs> relative to actual geographical markers like i mean you're out in the field actually meeting people going to these places and I really appreciate that about you. What's what's the totality of your cosmology at the moment? We was Kangs. <laughs> <laughs> you were down in Dade City when they were doing that mall thing. You were you were watching them aliens, weren't you? Yeah, we was aliens, bro. They what they whitewashed that. They did, dog. Now, uh, where am I at with everything? Uh, I don't know, you know, it's kind of the same place I started out. Florida's uh, the place of origin for at least one iteration, one version or subgroup of the human race. And that's pretty evident even in the mythologies of Eurasia. 
Some people came from the West in the mythologies of the Americas. Some people came from the uh, East and whether this was Atlantis or who knows, seems the greatest evidence for Atlantis being a fleet, at least being a naval sea power is to be found in Florida, not the Mediterranean, not Ireland, as you know, even though that's Atlantis too. The guy we bought the bookstore from, he says, Ireland is Atlantis. Uh, going to try and get him, going to try to get him to expound on that soon. But um, what's the, uh, the big picture? Don't know, but I'm working on a golf video, working on a Palm Beach video. My next big video will be Palm Beach, like similar style to the Jekyll Island one. Same concept to, you know, millionaire, billionaire retreat. Um, yeah, Palm Beach in the works. Palm Beach is a fun place. I, I, I married a, a PGA girl for a while. Nice. <laughs> so long ago, this has been great. I know, I know it's getting to your cat's bedtime over there in, uh, on the East coast. So, um, yeah, man, tell everybody where they can find you and all the rest of it. And we're going to sign on out. Sweet. Well, uh, you know, thanks again. To always good to talk. Um, people can find me old world, Florida on YouTube. Best fucking YouTube channel on the internet. By far. By far it is. Absolutely. And uh, definitely the best one repping Florida history. Odd, unique, supernatural, occult, conspiracy theory, etc. Having to do with Florida. Um, Old World Florida on YouTube. Old World Florida on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And also the Moringa Man. The Moringa oh, you're, Man, you're the Moringa, the Moringa Man dot com. Um, I only do this because I'm literally getting censored like hell on YouTube. I'm under, like I said, a week ban right now. Restriction can't go live, can't post, can't, you know, it's how I make my bread. It's how I make my bread. Cracker, how you make your these, crackers, these crackers <laughs> trying to come for a black man's living like that. You know, I mean. Well, you know, where do these crackers get off? Uh, they're coming for me for, shish, you know, condemning Israel a couple times, I guess, uh, whatever. But I'm actually banned right now for some stupid shit. I posted a picture of Adam getting created by God mm -hmm. uh, for the thumbnail of one of my pictures. Sorry, thumbnail of one of my videos. You know, famous, world famous painting that's all over YouTube all over our museums. You know why they pulled it? You know why I got this strike officially? Why? For nudity. <laughs> on fucking Michelangelo. What is it? Michelangelo? Da Vinci? Da Vinci? Fucking yeah, yeah. painting? Dude, That's if that's not 1984, if that's not Brave New World, I don't yeah. know what is. Okay? Where... So I, that's why I'm striked right now i think that was an excuse and there's a little bit of attitude behind that um on their part but it was stupid it was silly i appealed and they rejected it but blah 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 long pitch i'm only saying this because we're quite literally scrambling to find a way you know maybe gonna go to rumble i don't know wait to see what happens with youtube but if you want to support me and protect me from censorship so that I can, you know, go down other avenues. I'm going to do all the research no matter what, whether the money's there or not. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if people want to support me with money, you can buy some Moringa, which is amazing. Great. You know, mm -hmm. it's not no pyramid scheme bullshit supplement. It's literally just a leaf. It's amazing for you. I'm not going to pitch it any more than that. You can buy some Moringa and support me at the Moringa Man. Use Old World Florida code. Old World Florida, all caps, 15% off. And I get a little cut of that. And uh, I got a Patreon, Old World Florida. 
doesn't really nothing really goes on on there but you can support me and um yeah every time they hit us with more censorship it just makes me kind of say okay well screw this um you know this topic isn't taboo anymore this topic isn't you know if they already slap you on the wrist for it might as well say everything there is to say about it and whether we're on youtube or not the ship goes forward mm-hmm. and it, it does take dollar bills at least some part of the journey you know does require dollar bills and it, it always cringes me to you know ask or beg or whatever but that's kind of the stage we're in right now is fundraising i guess a little bit right or just for a future projects and yeah that's where we're at they can find me i send everybody that i can your direction and i'll continue to do so as usual this is always an intellectual like powerhouse of a, a conversation so i really appreciate you coming on Dude, tough. Thanks. Happy to speak the truth with uh, like like-minded people. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, signing out, y'all. See you on the flip side. And Mr. Longo, I'll see you next time I'm in Florida. Peace, Shelia. Good night. <laughs>